Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Darylin and today I am gonna repot some plants and I have a list of questions from everybody. So we're just gonna do a little chill repot with me Q&A. Thank you to everybody who submitted questions. I think this is gonna be kind of fun. So to be honest, like I wasn't expecting to get as many like plant care questions as I got. So I mean, hey, that's cool. Like I'm not really like an expert and I'm not gonna lie, like some of the questions that people had for me were like, I don't know the answer to, <laughs> but I can tell you kind of like what I think. So I don't know, we'll be transparent here, I guess. Anyway, I've got a whole bunch of plants behind me. Whoa, I'm stepping on Ralphie's food. Let me move it. All right, I got a whole bunch of plants behind me that need to be repotted. So I'm trying to decide which one I want to do first. I think I'm going to do this one. I think, I think I'm going to do this one first. Um, this is my like <laughs> philodendron El Chaco no ID. Like it looks like a philodendron El Chaco red, but it's like a little bit weird. So let's do that first. I'm excited because this plant has needed something to be done with it for a while. And I finally got the pots that are big enough. So as you can see, like I've got <laughs> this whole situation. I needed something that was going to fit it all. So this I think is gonna work. It looks like this plant was in mostly bark with some moss and some charcoal. And I mean, that looks like it, oh, some perlite. I think that's mostly just what's in here. So I'm gonna try and match it as well as possible. And before I do that, I also need to take out the air layering and take out the moss. This one alone might take a while. So I guess let's get started. Let's get the air layering undone first, I guess. I have some little, um, I don't know the word I'm looking for. They're like little scissors, like little botanical scissors that I'm gonna probably need for this. So I'm gonna go find those really quick. <laughs> All right, that was easy. They were sitting just on the table. Okay, so the first question that I got was, <laughs> how are you? And thank you so much to the person who asked that because girl, let me tell you, I'm good, but I am literally the busiest <laughs> right now that I've ever been in my entire life. Like even more so than high school when I was taking like seven AP classes and doing like nerdy debate, like extracurriculars that took up all my time and playing a sport, like <laughs> busier than college. So I'm just like really trying to get everything done. And basically it's because I started a full-time job in January. I don't know how many people know this, but prior to last month, I had been on like a 10 month sabbatical after my previous job, which was in the finance industry. And I kind of took the time to like reflect and kind of figure out what I wanted to do with, you know, my career going forward, because unfortunately I'm not like wealthy enough to be able to not work. So I had to figure something out. And fortunately I had enough kind of leeway to take that time. And eventually I did find a job with a wonderful company full of wonderful people and so far so good. Um, but I, <laughs> as a result, have like way less time to do plant stuff and to do YouTube stuff. So I'm just kind of trying to keep my head above water. All of that is still really exciting. So I'm like, I'm excited and I'm grateful and I'm like just trying to take it one day at a time, one opportunity at a time and try and give 100% to everything at once. And it's, it's a challenge, but I think it's gonna be worth it in the long run, so. That's how I am. I'm just, you know, taking things one day at a time. And yeah, we're gonna see, we're gonna see how things go from here. It's also growing season now, like is in full swing in San Diego, it's March. So my plants are all, I mean, my plants grew over the winter anyway, cause San Diego doesn't really have a winter and you know, I have grow lights and stuff. So my plants grew over the winter, but they're like all really starting to wake up now, which is so awesome. So things are, Things are looking up and I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just doing the best I can to not drop any of the myriad balls I have in the air. But hey, I think I really couldn't ask for like that much more, to be honest, right now where I am in my life. So, oh boy. Okay, so <laughs> I really left this for way too long. I don't know if you can see this, but it's like a giant like Kokodama level of air layering in here, so. I don't know that I'm gonna be able to get through all of this, but we will see. 
All right, so the next question that I got was, why did you stop doing the little jingle at the beginning of your old videos? And <laughs> that's that's a cute question, that's funny. Um, so the real reason, honestly, is not that exciting. It's just that I switched video editing software and the new software didn't have the music anywhere available. And so I couldn't really recreate it in, I mean, I switched from like a, an easy, like amateur kind of software to Premiere Pro. I couldn't really recreate it in Premiere Pro. And so <laughs> I kind of just was going to have to figure out something else in the first place. And I just decided to simplify things and not have that anymore. It was cute and it was fun while it lasted, but but yeah, I mean, it just, I didn't realize that I wasn't going to be able to continue doing it once I got into the new software. So nothing, uh, nothing like too interesting on that one. So then I also, someone asked me, why don't you post as much as you used to? And yeah, that's just, I, I started a full-time job and I just, I just don't have as much time as I used to, but I am starting to kind of get to the point now where I think I have cracked like the efficiency and like strategy for getting more done in the time I have. I've gotten a lot more efficient at editing, at setting up to film, at filming. I really would like to get back to posting twice a week again. It may not be twice a week every week, but I would definitely like to start posting more again because yeah, once a week is just like, your content flows out so slowly and I feel like I film a video and then it doesn't come out for like a month because I just can't get them out that quickly because you know, posting once a week, it's like, I don't know, I just have a lot more ideas than four per month. So keep an eye out. Um, the Tuesday videos may be coming back, like not every Tuesday, but some Tuesdays. I, I really like posting. I like doing YouTube, so. So yeah, keep an eye out for that. And then something that someone else asked me was, so what's going on with your plant shop? Like, do you have a plant shop? When's that coming? Like, what's the deal? And yeah, so. It is coming. It's just kind of one of those things where it's just been taking a lot more effort and like time to get it together than I really thought it was going to. Yeah, the first kind of hurdle was that the plants kind of took a long time to grow. I, I was not expecting them to take as long as they did, but I'm starting to get to the point now where I do have some things that will be ready for Forever Home soon. Because like the whole idea behind the shop is that I want to sell things that are like really good quality, you know, like, I just feel like there's a lot of plant people out there who are, who don't like have a place to buy things that they trust, that they can, you know, rely on being high quality and that all the care was taken to do it correctly. You know, there's so many things that like, even if you buy from a plant shop and spend the money and you know, you're, you're trying to mitigate your risk and you're paying to have something that's like more stable and solid that you're not going to have as much risk with. Like there's still a lot of sources out there that are, you know, selling plants for like marked up plant shop prices, but are not actually <laughs> taking uh, measures to make sure that what they're selling to people is actually you know, solid. So that's kind of the point. Like I am not trying to be another person that's like purging cuttings. Like not that there's anything wrong with that. And if you have the level of comfort with plants to buy unrooted cuttings and have them shipped to you and root them yourself and all that, like that's awesome. But not everybody does. And like some people just want to buy something and like get what they're paying for. So it's taken a little bit longer to kind of figure out how to like execute the mission behind the business. And then also just like boring things like getting licenses. And I am really indecisive about like what I want the logo to look like and the branding to look like. And I need to get it trademarked. And it's just like all this like stuff. And it's just me. Like I don't have an assistant or anything, obviously. So all of that's just taking a little bit longer. And then also not to be a, a bummer or a downer, but like my dog did pass away in September and that just really 
kind of stopped everything um, in its tracks. Like I was barely doing just like the minimum on YouTube and the plant shop kind of got put on the back burner. Um, and then we got a new puppy and like anybody who's ever had a puppy will know that they are <laughs> a lot of work. So it's I am getting to the point now where I have got a lot of the documents submitted and they're just pending. And I'm hoping to be able to start doing some like limited sales in the next few months. But um, yeah, it's definitely not gonna be like a huge scale thing at first. But I, I do want to do it the way I want to do it. Like, I don't want to settle for not how I want it. So it is just taking a little bit longer. But just be patient. And I really appreciate you guys being patient with me because, yeah, I think I announced it publicly, like, almost a year ago when I went on Jimmy's channel and we were talking about, you know, like, plant business and stuff. So it is kind of, I understand a little bit weird that it still hasn't kind of come to fruition yet, but it's just, you know, these things take time. I guess I would say like anyone who's thinking about starting a plant business, like I would definitely advise you to do it like a little at a time. Like, you know, just start with selling your extra cuttings and, you know, extra propagations and don't like go in too hard too fast is I guess what I would advise because it just takes a long time to get your money back. And so if you import a bunch of plants and like it takes longer to get money back than you're expecting, like it can be challenging, but yeah, like it's coming. Like it, it has to, I have to sell some of this stuff. I have way too much stuff in my house. So yeah, that's that. All right, so that's kind of the end of the just like personal questions. There weren't that many. Oh, my neighbor asked me how Ralphie's doing and I'm like, you know how Ralphie's doing, but yes, the answer is Ralphie is doing great. But yeah, now I guess we'll get more into like the care questions. There were a lot of people that had care questions. So the first one is what's an important part of plant care that people overlook, don't know, but would totally improve their plant health and growth? And the answer to that is people really overlook water quality. That is really important for tropical plants like aeroids, especially. Some plants like, um, you know, less kind of finicky plants, depending on where you live, like if your local water quality is pretty good, you might be able to get away with just watering them with tap water. But for aeroids, like um, especially anthurium and calathea and even some philodendrons and monstera, like you really have to give them filtered water, at least, at least, at least filtered water. Ideally, rainwater or aquarium water, fish water, or a reverse osmosis filter. But if you know, you can't do any of that, filtered water is definitely, you know, a viable option. That's what I do for my plants. Like I don't have any of that fancy stuff. I just kind of have to make do with filtered water, but you know, I also pH balance it too. So I think that is a big part of why I've been getting a lot of like really nice growth on my plants recently. And yeah, like that is definitely something that a lot of people really overlook. I feel like you always see people asking about like, oh, what's your soil mix? What's your soil mix? Or like, oh, I want to, you know, move to semi-hydro or, or whatever, because I want my plants to get bigger. And like, what kind of fertilizer do you use? What kind of nutrients do you use? But like, quite honestly, like water quality will get you uh, really far, like quite a lot further than maybe you would have ever thought. So I do have a video, I think it's called like how to prevent fungal spots and bacterial spots, where I talk a little bit more about like water quality and yeah, I would just recommend thinking more about that. Somebody actually also asked me like what nutrients I use for my plants and I use Liquidirt, Super Thrive and Half Strength uh, Tazula Orchid Fertilizer. And then I pH balance the water and I, I use Brita filtered water for that concoction. I, I highly recommend trying something like that. I mean, there's also, there's other like fertilizer cocktails that you can use, like depending on what you want to do and like what your goals are. But um, I highly recommend focusing on water quality because soil quality is important, but like soil and substrate, I, I feel like the battle there is more like finding the right like thickness and coarseness for your, for your conditions, figuring out like the right balance of like chunkiness and water retention and and finding something that's not going to give your plants edema and that's going to work year round in all seasons, but that's also
also gonna not dry out too fast for your habits. But water quality is, you know, if you have like the right water quality, like you can keep your plants in sphagnum moss indefinitely and they'll, they'll be fine. So that is my advice on that. Okay, so speaking of water and sphagnum moss, someone else asked, how do you know how much water to put into sphagnum moss to avoid root rot? So the answer to that is you're asking the wrong question. The uh, way that you kind of avoid root rot with sphagnum moss and any plants really is make sure that the roots that you're putting into the moss first and foremost, you know, are healthy and they don't have rot on them. So if it's like an imported plant or or whatever, make sure you're cleaning the rot off, removing any rot that's on there, any mushiness, that's important. Um, using clean moss. Sphagnum moss is actually so sterile naturally that it used to be used to pack wounds during wars, apparently, um, according to some YouTube video that I watched. And I thought that was really interesting. So keeping, you know, the medium clean first and foremost is important. But then with sphagnum moss, like I personally like to just bottom water my sphagnum moss or if I have it in a container that doesn't have drainage, I will just like tilt the cup to the side and like pour some water so it like slides down the cup and then pools in the bottom. And then the sphagnum moss is gonna redistribute it evenly like a sponge on its own. And the key there is that you just want to make sure you're not letting it dry out to the point that root is dying off because I feel like when people don't like they don't they're scared of root rot so they they don't want to overwater their plants but in the meantime of not wanting to overwater their plants they're underwatering their plants and then their root is dying off and then when they do water it again <laughs> the dead root is what rots and so you're not actually giving your plants root rot you're just killing the roots and then they're rotting so I keep a lot of my plants in sphagnum moss and uh, if you have a good water concoction you can get away with that for a long time and I just usually will kind of feel the moss and if the moss is dry on top and then I will just give the plant a little bit of water and I usually will bottom water the plant and let it soak up water until like the top is slightly damp or slightly moist and then if there's excess left over in the tray after that I just you know, dump it out. And that's that. I mean, plants are, man, I just broke a root. Plants are pretty resilient and they can, for the most part in sphagnum moss, like they can tolerate drying out completely. It's just don't let them be bone dry for too long. Like when the moss is like starting to like be pulled off the sides of the, of the vessel, like you've left it too long. So just keep that in mind. If you're having trouble kind of, or feeling a little bit like you're, you're not quite sure how to still how to tell that, like I would definitely recommend keeping your plant in a clear vessel so that you can see what the roots look like that is definitely something that has helped me um, when getting a new genus or when, you know, dealing with a plant that I'm just feeling a little bit like twitchy about because I really want to succeed with it. Clear pots are pretty difficult to find after about a six inch size. This is, I think, an eight inch pot and it was not easy to find and it's not even that clear. So yeah, I guess that is my, my take on that. Sphagnum moss is very underrated, I think. Like you can keep plants in sphagnum moss for a lot longer than, than you think. But if you don't want to keep them in forever, <laughs> like, yeah, I clearly have a problem where I leave mine in for too long and then I end up with a giant knot to untangle. And I don't think it's going to be possible for me to untangle this whole thing without breaking a significant amount of root because a lot of them are like fused together. So I'm going to do my best, but at a certain point I might just have to like break a few roots because what can you do? Alrighty, so next. Somebody asked me if I could air layer a plant and clear up questions about how to use LECA or perlite when potting up cuttings. Okay, so that's like kind of three questions at once. Air layering a plant is really easy. You just find the node on the plant that you want to root and, or there's an aerial root sometimes depending on what kind of plant it is. And you just get some sphagnum moss and get it a little bit damp and get some plastic wrap and wrap it around the node and tie it and that's pretty much it. The plant will usually start to root pretty quickly and put a little bit more water in there 
every every so often. And I mean, that's basically that. There's not a lot to it. The, the one thing that I would say with air layering though, is that if you've never done it before, the first time you do it, like do it on a plant, that's like, you know, not something that you are really, really invested in, like practice on something that's a little bit less of a uh, crown jewel in your collection. Because I remember the first time I tried air layering, I was so impatient to see what was going on that I kept like unwrapping it. It did start to root and then it dried out and the roots died. So just, I definitely suggest like the first couple times you try a new technique, you practice on something that it doesn't go well it's it's gonna be okay for you like emotionally because <laughs> yeah uh sometimes I can be very impulsive about you know just going for things and sometimes it works out fine and other times I'm like I shouldn't have done that and I regret it so going forward I think I'm gonna be a little bit more thoughtful in some of the projects that I do. But yeah, that's, uh, that is what I would say about air layering. I highly recommend it, honestly. Like ever since I like kind of got more practiced with air layering, like I don't even really cut plants without doing it anymore. I just don't see the point, like why increase the amount of risk of the, of the cutting making it when, I mean, when you air layer stuff, it's like a hundred percent success rate as opposed to like less than that when you don't air layer it. So I don't see like what the point is, but yeah, that is a, uh, that's my take on that. So, um, which plants like to be more root bound versus having leg room? Um, the, like nobody really knows the answer to that question. <laughs> It's impossible to really give like a blanket statement for plants across the board. I would say that for me, I just almost always leave things way past the point where I should intervene. And the only negative aspect to that, I think, is that when it's time for me to repot the plant, it's a lot more difficult. So like you can see, I left this plant way too long and I'm like having to untangle this like crazy moss situation. Yeah, that is really the only negative. Plants are resilient. And as long as you don't leave them to the point where it's like they have literally no soil in the pot, you can kind of just prioritize it more on like what works for you more so than what works for the plant. Alocasia, I have heard, prefer to have more space in their pot. And if your alocasia just like stops growing and it's not winter time, your plant might need a repot. I've heard Hoya generally tend to like a little bit more of a, a tight fit in the pot. And Thurium? They don't really care. Like they just like consistency for the most part. Like I will see like with my anthurium, I'll show you. I've noticed for the most part with anthurium that they prioritize growing their roots downward rather than like filling up the pot and growing a lot of them in these like cups. I've, I've noticed that a lot of them do this like ring around the bottom of the cup thing. And so for anthurium, once again, it's more just like the longer you leave them, the harder it is going to be to repot them, especially if they're just in moss. That's my take. Like if you start to see that your plant is drying out way faster than it ever used to and like the seasons haven't changed from like spring to summer or something like that, then maybe that's an indication. Or when you start getting like lots of roots coming out the bottom of the pot, I don't think it like really matters as much as people think it does like unless you wait until the point where it's like an extreme but yeah I mean I don't really know like my plants being root bound is not something that I think about very much to be quite honest but maybe that's just because my conditions don't really necessitate that my plants are like in a perfectly nestled situation in their pots. So I don't know. That's my two cents on it. I, I, I don't know. But yeah, I think it's one of those things that unless you really, really leave it to like an extreme or you repot it way too early and there's way too much space in the pot and the plant rots as a result, I really wouldn't worry about it. Like if your plant is growing, if your plant is, is happy, just leave it. Leave it until you start to feel like I need to change the situation to be more convenient for me and then figure out what you wanna do with it. That's kind of how I'm approaching things lately because I find that I 
um, used to be a lot more worried about like what was best for my plants than what was like better for me and my house and my space and the people I live with. And yeah, after a while, you so many plants, like you just can't do that anymore. You know, you have to like live in your house. And so I just am trying really hard to keep in mind that like I live here, it's my house and the plants are just, you know, kind of guests in the house and and yeah, oh my goodness, this is just like, this is out of control. I'm getting somewhere with it, but yeah, I'm just gonna have to like kind of pull. Oh, there we go. Oh, there's one, okay. Yeah, you can actually pull root a lot harder than you like probably feel like you should. And the little like kind of branching like secondary roots, like they may snap off, but the plant will be fine. All right, next question. What is something that I wish I knew before getting into houseplants? Um, a lot of things. <laughs> Actually, the first video that I ever posted on this channel was so you think you want to get into plants. And it was basically me just like rattling off like a whole bunch of like really specific like pitfalls of having houseplants that I wish that I had considered before I like really got into it. But it, that video is like really different than a lot of the other stuff on this channel. So if you haven't seen it, like it might be weird. But I think the biggest thing that I wish I'd known was kind of the slippery slope of how easy it is very quickly to start just like not seeing the money that you're spending on plants as like actually spending money and how fast it adds up. Like forget the cost of the plants because you know, your $10, $20 pothos or whatever, or Hoya from a big box store, like over the course of the lifetime of the plant, like they're gonna need like, you know, the same kinds of things that a fancy plant needs, like new pots, new substrate. And especially with like fancy, like tropical plants, you know, if you wanna try out something like trying out semi-hydro or like trying out LECA or like, I've like experimented with things and then been like, oh, well I didn't get results from LECA so now I wanna try pawn, now I wanna try this and try that. And like, like every single like project that you undertake or experiment or, or whatnot, like it all adds up so fast and just be more mindful of your budget and how much money your hobby is taking <laughs> from your budget. And also just keep in mind too, that like every spring when all the plants need like systemic pest treatments and you know, a lot of them need to be repotted and a lot of them need moss poles. And it's like, I, in the spring have a good couple weeks, maybe even like a month month long sprint of just spending all of my free time dealing with plants. And every spring it's like, oh my God, this is costing me so much money. So just, you know, if you're somebody who has like a nice collection of plants, but you're thinking about like, oh, I really want to try this and I want to try that. And I want to get, you know, more of these and more of this and more of that. Like just keep in mind that you need to pay attention to how much money you're spending because like once you have the plants, it's really really hard to justify like not spending the money to you know to take care of them especially if they're expensive plants you you start to feel like you have to spend like a lot of money to make them happy there's a lot of trial and error with things like for example i bought an anthurium splendidum for the first time like last year and it didn't go very well and you know i tried this and i tried that and i bought this for it and i bought that for it and none of it worked and then eventually i decided i wanted to try again and I bought another one and this time I got really good advice as to what to do with it. And so I got the jar for it and it, uh, it liked the jar so much it outgrew it like really quickly. So I had to buy another jar and just, but then like, so imagine that, but like times a hundred. I'm not trying to like discourage anyone from doing what they want. I just, I just wish personally for me, I had known how much money it's like really, really easy to like shell out without even thinking, especially, oh my God, especially if you get thrips. Like if you get like a, a collection wide outbreak of pretty much any pest is it's bad and it's expensive, but thrips especially, yeah, that was rough. That was rough. So I guess that's what I would, I would say is just like, before you make a commitment to a large amount of plants, <laughs> keep in mind what you're comfortable with as far as budget, because you may get to a point where you have to kind of like 
spend a lot more money than you ever wanted to. And it's so easy to not even notice it because like, oh, $20 here for more sphagnum moss and $30 there for a new cover pot. And you know, oh, like pawn is in stock. Let me, let me stock up and oh, $60 to stock up on, on pawn or like, oh, I want to try like this new soil mixture. So you buy like a whole bunch of like cocoa chips and then you don't really get the results you wanted to see from that. So then you never use them again. And it's just, oh, like what's the new like trendy thing to put in your soil mix? Like, oh, tree fern and like $40 for tree fern because it's like back ordered. It's just, you know, oh, and don't even get me started on like greenhouses and grow tents and mills bows. And you know, just, just, I'm kind of rambling here. I could probably talk about that all day. Just like be aware that that stuff adds up and if you are someone who has a budget or just someone who like hates spending money like just keep in mind that uh sometimes yeah plants are expensive that i guess is the wisdom i would impart on people okay so then another question was acclimation question how long do you leave plants in water when you're acclimating them from import i'm guessing is what he means particularly in thurium when you have to reroute them Okay, so I, when I import plants, uh, it's almost always philodendrons and anthurium. And I usually leave the philodendrons in water until they have water roots. You can kind of leave philodendrons in water as long as you want. Um, there's really no rush to do anything for them, to be quite honest. And I'm really glad that I figured that out because I remember I, I used to just not even really like getting plant mail because I would always be like so stressed out about, oh, I gotta like, you know, get everything set up for these plants and whatnot. And it's like, actually, yeah, you can leave philodendrons in water indefinitely. So if you are just not feeling up to dealing with a whole bunch of shit on, on the day that your plant is arriving, just stick your philodendrons in water and leave them until you have the energy to deal with it. For anthurium, um, a lot of the time I don't even put them in water. I am really a proponent of you get the anthurium, you look at the roots, remove all the rot. Usually, at least with the sellers that I work with, if the plant is completely unrooted, they disclose that before it's shipped and they give me a discount. And I haven't actually had an anthurium come in with zero roots in a really long time. Like a lot of these sellers have really been working on that and I haven't had one come in with like literally nothing that I can use in a really long time. So for like 99% of my anthurium, I just cut the rod off. Uh, sometimes I'll disinfect them with like a little Fysan 20 and then I just put them into moss and then put them either in my grow tent or the greenhouse, uh, the tabletop greenhouse or um, a prop box. And for most anthurium, that is fine. Even the ones that have literally nothing, that's probably fine. Then you just leave them and let them do their thing and eventually they will have roots. And I, um, yeah, I mean, moss in a clear container and you'll be able to tell when they have roots. So that's my advice. Um, the only anthurium that I don't really advise doing that with 100% of the time is a queen anthurium. Um, and I have a whole video about what to do with queen anthurium. So if you want to look at that, go watch that. But yeah, honestly, like it's, I feel like I got so like stressed out by dealing with imports for so long. And in retrospect, now that I know what I know, it really wasn't necessary. Like they, like plants are a lot more simple than, than you'd really think. Um, I guess the other plant that I wouldn't say you could just do that with would be Anthurium splendidum. Like you can put it in moss. It, it Mine love moss, but you just, you have to put them in like, a jar because they don't like sudden drops or fluctuations in humidity like even the grow tent uh it didn't like it and it lost all its leaves so but yeah um i don't think it's like rocket science i used to be like really mystified by it but i think that you know just for the, when in doubt i mean just stick the plant in moss and stick it in high humidity and it will probably do fine i of course am mostly speaking about philodendron anthurium syngonium monstera Hoya, I would probably put in perlite. Alocasia, I've never imported an alocasia, so I don't know. But yeah, um, high humidity. Like I will just die on that hill. Like high humidity vessels for newly imported plants. It's the difference between like having a new leaf a couple of weeks to a month after you get your plant or having a stump. 
So highly, highly, highly recommend um, whether you want to do like a tote box or a tabletop greenhouse or grow tent or whatever. Um, I actually had a vi I have a video about humidity vessels. So if you're not sure, go check that out. That's where we're at on that. I, I'm pretty happy with it, with the results. I haven't, I don't think I've like lost anything that, that way in a, in a really long time. That is my recommendation there. Okay, um, I use liquid dirt on all my plants. I thought it was a plant food and a mild fertilizer. Learning it might not really be a fertilizer. Should I add one to my mix? I don't really understand the difference other than fertilizer can burn roots. So that is true. Liquid dirt is not a fertilizer. It is just like a supplement or something. Um, I don't really understand how that can be possible given the list of ingredients of all the different like organic fertilizers like bat guano and like all sorts of other like rabbit droppings and all sorts of other crazy stuff that's listed as like ingredients into liquid dirt. Um, but apparently it is true. You do have to add fertilizer to it. So what I do, I do use liquid dirt and I am pretty happy with the results I get from it. I just add like half strength orchid fertilizer to, uh, to my liquid dirt water. I just follow the directions and I like to add a little super thrive too. And then I pH balance my water. So yes, I wish that was like more clearly articulated in the instructions with like how to use liquid dirt but it's not. So yeah, if you use liquid dirt and, or you, you have used it in the past and you're like, I don't understand like why people like this so much. It doesn't do anything. Yeah. You have to add fertilizer. When do you know that it's time to water your plants in LECA or pond? Um, so really the answer to that is that you shouldn't let your plants in LECA or pond, um, have a fully dried out reservoir. I, I'm actually kind of not a fan of LECA. <laughs> the reason that I was really interested in transitioning my plants to semi-hydro was that I wanted to be able to have things set up in a self-sustaining way long enough that I could, you know, go on a week-long vacation and come back and like nothing would be dead. And with LECA, if your plant dries out all the way, at least in my experience, if like there's no water in that reservoir, the roots dry out and desiccate so quickly. And then as soon as you fill that reservoir back up, they rot. Um, and I usually don't struggle with that too much, but in Southern California, every once in a while, we'll have this weather phenomenon called Santa Ana winds, where like these really hot, dry winds blow in from the desert. And the humidity in my house is generally in like the high 50s to mid 60s, which is really good for ambient household humidity. But during Santa Ana winds time, it can drop to like 15% really quickly. And when that happens, my plants <laughs> guzzle water. And there have been a few times where I didn't refill my plants reservoirs like fast enough with LECA during the Santa Ana winds and my plant rotted when I refilled it. So yeah, with LECA, like you, not only do you not want to let your reservoir fully dry out, but you also need to flush your LECA every so often. Like my friends who are like really devoted to LECA say like every six weeks or so you want to flush the LECA. So that's another thing to think about. Like if you have a collection of hundreds of plants and then you want to put them in LECA, it's a lot of water to flush them. So just keep that in mind. Like if you live somewhere where your water bill is really high, um, in order to kind of like get around that, like most of the plants I have in LECA or pond, I keep them in the self-watering pots that have like the, the gauge on them to, that shows, you know, like how high the water level is. So just, yeah, I don't, I don't let the water reservoir like fully dry out. Otherwise, you know, you can, you can have rot, which is like exactly the opposite of what you want. Oh, someone else asked, when do you repot your philodendrons? I've heard, let them get root bound because they're tropical. And then I've heard the complete opposite, lol, which is it? Okay. So like I already talked about kind of my philosophy on repotting plants, but specifically with philodendron, specifically with climbing philodendron, you want to actually like what I'm going to start trying to do is kind of like think of my moss poles as like part of my pot. There's this guy on Instagram. Uh, I forget like what his name is. If you have questions about growing philodendron and like repotting and moss poles and whatnot, like this guy's Instagram is really cool. Um, but basically 
I'll find it and I'll put it on the screen. But basically, like, he posted a reel the other day where he demonstrated how much root he has on his plants in his moss poles and, like, how he's able to grow these, like, gigantic plants with leaves the size of umbrellas in pots that look really small. The thing about philodendrons that climb especially is that really what they want is they want to root into something at every node. And so rather than worrying about like, oh, when do I repot my plant? I would worry more so about like making sure that they have like a moss pole to root into and that you're keeping it moist, you're keeping it wet, you're giving it fertilized water. Honestly, like a climbing philodendron that's well rooted into a moss pole, like you're really only gonna have to repot it when like it's toppling over because it's gotten too top heavy for the pot. So, I mean, if you aren't interested in doing it that way, another kind of good indication is like, <laughs> are there roots coming out of the bottom of the pot? And for crawlers, obviously, like when they reach the edge of the pot and they're growing out of the pot and like spilling over, like <laughs> probably good to repot them then. But yeah, like the thing about philodendrons and like epiphytic climbing plants in general is that they want to root at every node. So let them, give them a pull. And you know, there's lots of really good information on YouTube about poles and how to make them and um, different strategies and different materials. And like, there may be some trial and error, you know, maybe start it off with uh, a plant that you're not super in love with or, or take a cutting, um, you know, maybe like start off with like a philodendron Brazil or a Mykins or, or a pothos or something and kind of experiment with, with your moss pole strategy before you, you know, put something expensive on a pole because they can be difficult to keep moist. But I, I guarantee you that is going to be a much better strategy. Most, most philodendrons, when you buy them, like they probably have what, like one, maybe two nodes max, like rooted into the pot. But, you know, as they grow up a pole, they could have like 10, 12 rooted in. I would, I would honestly like just change your focus to, to not worry as much about two nodes at the base of the plant and much more so about giving all of them an opportunity to root in. My philodendron majestic in my bedroom, it's not on a moss pole, but I have like air layered every node and like secured it to my like shelf. It's kind of like climbing up the shelf. And yeah, it's definitely gotten bigger leaves as it's climbed. So that is kind of how I'm going to be approaching it from now on. I have a couple of plants that I need to put on poles and kind of continue to practice. But yeah, I'm not I'm not really gonna worry about about that anymore, I think is the answer to your question. Oh, man, this, I like, honestly, like I've been untangling this for an hour. So <laughs> we might only repot one plant, but that's okay. All right, let's see. Um, that's all the questions that were submitted on YouTube. Let's go to Instagram. Oh my God, it's so hard to use the phone when my hands are covered in moss. Like, shoot, I'm like not able to find the questions that were submitted on Instagram. <laughs> Ugh, I'm so sorry. If you submitted a question on Instagram, I can't figure out how to like get back in and view them. So lovely. Um, hopefully, I mean, we're getting like closer. This is looking a lot better. I'm getting a lot more like brazen with like <laughs> just pulling it apart. Oh, I do remember somebody asked me, what's my favorite, uh, I th so I think they asked me like, what's my favorite plant of the species I have? Or like, what's my favorite plant of each species I have? But I think what they meant was like, what's my favorite plant of each genus that I have? So like my favorite philodendron, my favorite monstera, my favorite anthurium, et cetera. Um, so that is a really good question. It's a fun question. So for philodendrons, I would say my favorite philodendron is my philodendron luxuriens. I love those. I, those have been my favorite for a really long time. Like that was my number one wish list plant for a long time. And it's definitely my favorite plant. Like the one that I have right now is struggling a little bit. Like the Santa Ana, Ana winds really did a number on her. So we are rerouting her and we're gonna like fix her situation. Philodendron luxuriance, definitely not a great beginner plant. <laughs> um, so I don't really recommend them unless you really want a challenge, but that's my favorite philodendron for sure. And then for anthurium, um, that's a really hard one. I don't know. I think maybe like, I think my favorite anthurium is probably my anthurium ace of spades. It's really beautiful. I really like it a lot. 
For Monstera, my favorite Monstera, I mean, it's gotta be my Albos. Just, you know, classic, you can't really beat them. Um, I'm really lucky I have some really pretty ones and they've never really given me a ton of trouble. So have to go with, with the Monstera Albos. And then for Syngonium, definitely my Syngonium Green Splash. Like that's the, I never wanted Syngonium was never interested in Syngonium. And then I found out about those and those are the Syngonium that like made me care about Syngonium. So definitely the Syngonium Green Splash. Um, Hoya would have to be the Hoya Polynura. Uh, that was like, that was like, so I've had my Hoya Crimson Queen for like three years. I think the Hoya Polynura was like the first rare Hoya that I got. And I, yeah, I really like it. I think it's fun. My my Hoya uh, Polynura in, in particular is fun because it's really splashy. So it's really pretty. I enjoy it a lot. Um, then let's see, I have some, I have like a couple orchids. I don't remember what the exact species is, but I have a Paphiopetalum. Oh, Paphiopetalum callosum pygmy type, I think is what it is. And that is my favorite. I think I only have two. And the other one, I don't remember the name of, but no, the, the Paphiopetalum for sure is my favorite orchid that I, I have in my collection. Um, Alocasia is my Alocasia black velvet for sure. I, I love a dark veiny leaf. I love a velvet leaf. I, I love a plant that just kind of doesn't really need a ton of help and just kind of grows and vibes and like, you know, is laid back. And that's, that's a great plant. That's a great alocasia for beginners. Like all you need to do is like put them in self watering and like never let them dry out. And they're really good. Um, what else do I have? Calathea. Probably just my regular old Calathea medallion roseopicta. I really, I really like Calathea. They're fun. They're a good like confidence builder. Like I, I kind of want to say like, if you are afraid to try Anthurium, get a Calathea and like see how that goes because Anthurium actually have a lot of like similar kind of care needs to, to Calathea. And so if you can kind of deal with them and troubleshoot them, you should be able to figure out an anthurium. Um, oh, that's a big piece. What else do I have? Peperomia. So I only have one Peperomia and it's the Peperomia maculosa. So I guess I have to go with that. Ficus, I only have one ficus and that is my ficus ruby, ficus elastica ruby. And um, I love it. I would actually like to get more ficus. I would like to get a shaveriana and I would like to get a, just like, oh, I would really like to get a burgundy rubber plant um, that has really dark leaves, but I guess the ficus taniki ruby or ficus elastica ruby is my favorite ficus because it's the only one I have. I think that's everything. I have like one. Oh, I, I have some cactus. I, I really like Kevin. He's my cactus that's out on my porch. Um, I don't know that he's like doing that well. He had scale for a while and I didn't know what, what was wrong and I kind of let it go for longer than I probably should have. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how well Kevin's doing. And I don't know what kind of cactus he is either, but someday if I have a, uh, like a patio somewhere where cactus can grow outside, I would love to get some like really tall ones to, to sit on my porch. That would be cool. <sighs> wow. Just so much root getting pulled off of here at this point. Um, just really not a whole lot you can do about it. I have a ZZ plant. I have a ZZ raven. So I guess that's my favorite of whatever genus ZZ plants are in. I think that's it. I think that's all my plants. I'm trying to remember what some of the other questions from Instagram were. I read through them. Oh, um, so I, I didn't answer the part that somebody had asked me about, like what, what to do with um, like LECA and perlite when potting out cuttings. Okay, so the only way that I know how to put a plant into LECA is to put it into water, leave it in water until it grows water roots, and then fill up the container that it's in with LECA until like the LECA is like all the way filled up over, you know, the water line. And then just naturally let it like evaporate. And then as it evaporates out, like don't fill the container up all the way with water again. That will work. Um, perlite, uh, the major thing with perlite is that you need to rinse it. You need to rinse it like a lot because perlite is a type of like puffed volcanic rock. And so the little rock dust, like the little perlite dust 
uh, if you don't rinse it and you let it stay in your soil, it will form like a like a cement. Like it'll it'll trickle down to the bottom of your pot as you water and form like a cement that uh, will basically choke off the roots and cause your plant to get edema. Um, so always rinse your perlite. Um, propagating with perlite, I mean, you just kind of stick the cuttings into the perlite and put leave some water in the bottom of the cup. And then when you're ready to pot them up, you can pot them into soil, you can pot them into pond, you can do pretty much whatever you want. I've never really heard of somebody potting uh, per cuttings from perlite into LECA. Like generally, if you're trying to use LECA, you want to root the plant in water first. So yeah. I think that was the other question. Oh my God, this has taken such a long time. I'm getting like really impatient too. I'm just like really pulling through these roots. It's, there's so much root here that I'm not really worried about it. Like it'll rebound. Ugh, da, 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 da. I'm glad I'm getting this done though. Cause like this needed to be done a long time ago and it just, you know, got put off and got put off and got put off. And now here we are. <laughs> We're getting there. We're almost done. Man, I thought that I, well, I mean, I guess it's been going for over an hour. So I, I didn't think I was gonna get through all the questions, but I guess, I guess I did. Thank you for all those questions. Alrighty, I actually think that this is, I'm gonna actually just take that leaf off cause it was like kind of dying anyway and it was bent and it was in my way. I've like been on this kick lately of like, if a leaf is inconvenient for me of cutting it off, which I'm sure a lot of people would be horrified by, but I actually feel like it's like pruning back the, like my plants sometimes is it, it I, I think it actually really is like beneficial, but all right, so I think that, that is looking much better. Like it's okay that there's a little bit of moss left on it because there's gonna be some moss in this mix. Like I'm gonna try my best to just mirror what the plant's already in. And it's looking like it's mostly bark, moss. Let's see. Oh, okay. So it looks like it's in, oh wow, look at all those roots. You probably can't see. Um, so it's in, oh, perlite at the bottom, like really chunky perlite, and then bark and moss and a little charcoal. All right, so you know, that's pretty standard. So let's get, let's get some perlite to put on the bottom. I actually think since I don't have, um, perlite that's this chunky like this is like rocks almost i almost wonder if leca would be better yes i think leca would be better so i'm gonna go get some leca and i'll be right back i haven't opened this yet all right man i had like ambitions to repot a lot more than just one plant so Maybe I'll just end it after we finish with the with Lucille and uh, just film another one, a film another repot with me. Cause so I don't really want to do like a two hour video, but everything's all set up and I kind of just like want to get this done, you know? So yeah, if you've never used LECA before, it uh, they're like kind of like clay balls. So they've got a lot of um, like dust on them. So you have to rinse it. And I'm hoping that the holes in the bottom of this are not big enough for the LECA to like come out of. <laughs> I need to go grab a tray for this pot. I have one that's big enough. All right, that should be good. Is that enough LECA? Do I want more? I'm gonna put a little bit more. That's probably too much. Yeah, this is like, <laughs> It's like all falling out, but that's okay. I will get the reservoir tray and stick it in there and then it won't be a problem. Okay, so what did I say that this was primarily? Let's see, there's bark, moss, perlite. It's like a layer of perlite, a layer of bark, and then like some moss sprinkled in. Okay, there's some bark. And I like to put charcoal in, um, just a little bit. All right, let's see. 
making a mess. Um, all right, so I'm gonna have to cut off like basically all these like lower, like just pull off these lower leaves. That's fine. They aren't looking the best anyway. <sighs> okay. Can you like see hopefully? All right, I think this will work. She already looks so much happier. I'm glad I finally got around to doing this. Next time this plant needs repotted though, it's gonna be, <laughs> it's gonna need a lot of, um, a lot of work. It's gonna need to go into something huge. What happens with this if it con continues trying to crawl or if it actually starts growing upward now that it's not being weighed down anymore by the air layering? Um, it might just be like a weird Chaco, which would, kind of be annoying because yeah I definitely did not pay like Chaco price for it I paid Philodendron Luxurian's price for it so that's probably too much so yeah but all right so Miss Lucille is all all potted up she looks so good how pretty she is all right cool so I'm gonna set her aside all right, so that was really long. Thanks for chilling with me and bearing with me through that. Thanks for all the questions. Uh, feel free to send some more my way for another repot with me at some point. I'm, let's see, what am I at, an hour and 30 minutes? Yeah, I'm gonna edit this down a lot, hopefully, so. Anyway, I will see you in my next one. Bye!